Hello and welcome to this special edition of Bus TV. I'm joined by Susie Twist. Morning. And today we have the pleasure of interviewing Sir Lindsay Hoyle, the Speaker of the House of Commons. See you. So if, if I could start by asking, what was your first experience on entering uh, the House of Commons? When I, when I first came, it was, you know, it, it, to be elected, uh, to be elected for my hometown was absolutely amazing. But to walk into a working museum, and that's what really Parliament is, you're in awe. And the experience you have is that everybody's too busy and nobody really wants to help you. And, and you've got to make your own way, you know. At least I was lucky because my father had been a member of Parliament, so I knew my way around a little bit. But I think it's this fantastic building and uh, the privilege of being elected to represent my hometown and being sent to London, um, you know, it, you can never get over how moving it was to walk into that building the first time and to actually to be sworn in as the Member of Parliament for Charlie. It, you know, it absolutely was, was amazing. It will stick with me forever, you know. The fact is I turned up, I've been elected, uh, all these new MPs, nobody knew what they were doing. And just, get, you know, you're in awe of this fantastic property. And the police, oh, come on in, sir. You know, it's all that kind of thing. You know, you just, I, I'm just going to say, it was just an amazing feeling uh, of, of going in this spectacular building and being here for a few years since. Yeah, and I bet it gives you goosebumps just talking about that experience. Um, so do you remember your first speech? The first, the first speech I made, uh, we, we, because the, we had questions, but of course you need to make your speech very early on. And what it is is your maiden speech. You're absolutely right. And in fact, I've still got a bound copy of it at home. My maiden speech was speaking about. You always say something nice about the previous MP, or you meant to do, and hopefully that would would, would come across. And then you talk about your constituency. You talk about a little bit about the bill of a way of attaching your speech to it. So for me, it was about speaking about Chorley, my hopes, my vision, and how I see the future panning out. And, and, and just saying how grateful I was to actually be a member of Parliament. Um, it seems so long ago now, 1997. But at home, I've still got that speech on the shelf in a bound copy. And it's interesting because we're given this bound copy and all our, and your name is in, Lindsay Hoyle MP, you know, and it says Maiden Speech, 1997. So I've got to say, you know, amazing when I think back of coming in uh, and speaking for the very first time um, in, in, in a speech is always that you need to get it over and done with. I always say to people, never hold back. Get your speech in there, get it done with, because at least then, You've got the, the hard part is speaking for the first time. Once you've spoken once, it becomes so much easier thereafter. I bet. Could I just introduce Susan again? Uh, Susie's got a question for you, Sir Lindsay. Hi, Sir Lindsay. My question is, how difficult is it to remember all the MPs' names and the constituents <laughs> they represent? <laughs> what I always say is, I know every MP but I don't necessarily know them all at the same time. <laughs> so it, it, it is funny because somebody you don't see much, you're concentrating on them to make sure you've got the name and work out where they're from. I think, I think the difficulty is that it's the person that you know so well and you have a blank. You absolutely have a blank. And it can be somebody that you've known for 20 years and suddenly it just goes out of your head. Um, luckily, I seem to do all right. And if I can't remember, the fallback's dead easy. Would the honourable member like to speak now? You know, I've always got a fallback of words that I can use. So far, so good. You know, it, it isn't easy. Um, 
And, and, it, and it is quite difficult. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, every election, you've got to start all over again. There's so many new faces. But during COVID, because we've been off and people haven't been around, you forgot about people. And so therefore, it's a bit of catch up in your own mind. Let me just try and remember that. So we sometimes play a, play a bit of a game. Who's that up there? So between myself and the clerk who stands at the side of me, uh, we, we, we'll have a bit of a guessing game until we get them all. So between Helen and myself, I've got to say, we're, we're pretty good at getting all, all the members. But it's just a rogue member that might come in that you've not seen for about 12 months. Absolutely, you're like, oh, my word, who is it? But, yeah, overall, I've got to say, I do pretty well. I know everybody, as I say, my excuse is maybe not always at the same time. Oh, that, that's wonderful. Great, it, yeah, wonderful. Um, we have a question from uh, one of our members, Matthew. And Matthew is on screen. Brilliant. Hello, Matthew. Hello, Salinza. Uh, my name is Matthew Pickerance. What were your emotions when being dragged to the speaker's chair? I've got it. No, I've, Matthew, I've got it. What were my emotions like being dragged to that chair? Well, I've got to tell you, I don't believe any speaker was dragged. We're all running to get to that chair. Whatever they might say, Matthew, let me tell you. <laughs> I, I, I genuinely believe that you go through a process where you're elected to become speaker. And this idea is that we're all meant to want to refuse it and be bashful about being dragged. I've never seen speakers try and drag themselves back from going to that chair. So what I want to say is, there's a bit of a pretense like, oh, oh, but really we're all pushing to get there. So I'm going to say the emotions of being dragged there was, let me get in that chair, I want to take over. And, and, and from that, I think, was, you know, it's a fantastic feeling, you know, to know that I've been elected the 158th Speaker of the House of Commons, 750 years of speakers, and I'm the 158th. You know, in itself was amazing. But to be... Uh, Lancashire MP becoming the first speaker to the House of Commons was absolutely amazing. Amazing. I think we've got a short clip of, of you actually uh, being taken oh, to the wow. chair. Invite Sir Lindsay Hoyle to take the chair of the House. Must have been so emotional for you as well to be kind of, you know, within that position. Yeah, it was really good. I enjoyed it. I've got, I, I'm still thinking back, you know, and I'm just, it, it, was, it was a crazy day and night, went on forever. But in the end, we got there and it was just, it's just the whole thing of, of thinking about it, you know, and I just think, my, what a, what, what a long day. And it, it was interesting because the people who come to watch my family were the, uh, Baroness Boothroyd who'd been the previous speaker she, she came to watch and she's given me the thumbs up yeah I've, I've got to say it was really fa fantastic in the sense that every, everybody's there and it was a packed packed chamber and just knowing my family's there as well my wife my father was there my daughter you know the grandchildren it was just absolutely amazing and the office as well that had come down from Chorley you know so it, it, it was really like a Lancashire day out in a sense. Lancashire hits London. Lancashire now takes over in London. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so, Lindsay, we have a question from Megan Walker, one of our members. Lindsay, my name is Megan Walker. How difficult is it to be impartial and not having an opportunity to get involved within the debate? That's a very good question, Megan. And I think the impartiality is, and, and you've got to ask yourself this, if you want the job, you've got to genuinely do it for the right reasons, and that's trying to make a better House of Commons, and therefore you've got to show your impartiality. I resigned the Labour Party that I've been a member of nearly all of my life, and the fact that I had to give that up is not an easy thing to do. But in the end, I shouldn't take the job if I can't accept that part of that job is being impartial, being honest to everybody in that chamber. 
and playing it straight down the middle. So I've got to say, it was that, you know, knowing that was the way. I've been the mayor of Chorley, and when you're the mayor of a town, like St. Helens, whatever, you've got to be impartial. The mayor is rises above it. And in a sense, the speaker also has got to rise above it and show that impartiality. The only time I'm not impartial is when it comes to rugby league. I've always got to say, I'll always try and get a point in on Warrington. So, you know, my impartiality is there everywhere in politics. Maybe not in sport in the chamber when I give Warrington a bit of a shout. Especially if we can say something bad about Wigan. <laughs> I'm from Wigan, so Lindsay, so uh, we'll leave it there. Peter, who's in the room with me, he's a big Wigan fan. That's why I'm deliberately saying it because he can't speak. <laughs> 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 Susan. Uh, right, our next question is from another one of our members. Um, it's Laura McIntyre. Hello, sorry Lindsay, my name is Laura McIntyre and what I like to know is, do you like to turn the MPs off? <laughs> um, uh, I better say no. Um, I've, got, I've, I've, I've got to say no. Um, I don't really like telling people off. Uh, sometimes you get a little bit of, uh, you know, um, it was interesting uh, last Wednesday where I was seemed to be telling everybody off. It's easier in my life if I don't have to tell anybody off. I think when I'm telling, telling people off, it means how bad the situation's got. So my preference is, no, I don't enjoy it. I'd sooner have a much easier life where it's nice and quiet. Um, and not having to stand up and actually put everybody back in their place. So as much as I've got to do it now and again, I've got to say, no, there is no real pleasure in it. You know, sometimes you have a thing, mm, I got one over there, that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think Laura's picked a, Laura's picked a, a clip to, to, to explain and show you. I um, don't think it's telling off, but I think it's you being very firm. This is a, a, a leader of the opposition who sat on the front oh, bench oh, oh, uh, whilst oh, there was oh, anti oh, no. I think there are questions being asked. We do need to try and answer the questions that's being put to the Prime Minister. It will be helpful to those who are watching to know the answers. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I think it will be helpful to, to all those who are watching to know. Prime Minister, I think I'll make the decisions today. Come on. Prime Minister. Sorry, Mr Speaker, if I, if I may say this, I think it will be helpful to all those who are watching to know that this opposition and this leader of the opposition said absolutely nothing. So you seem to enjoy that bit. Well, I'm, I'm not meant to. I think, I think, I think, I think it's just because I'm friendly. And, yeah. and, and just a kind of happy person. So it's just because I was happy, not happy what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. Thank you. The next question is, how long can you be the speaker for? It's a very good question. In theory, as long as people want me. Um, so th there is no time limit as such. In fact, the last speaker did over 10 years. Well, it was 10 years before he left. Um, usually the average is about nine. Uh, but, you know, in the end, if... What, what I would say is I've never said how long I'll do because I just don't know how long I want to be putting myself up. But in the end, you have to be re-elected after every general election. And what I would say is that uh, my full intention is to stand after the next election. Um, absolutely. You know, I, I love the job. I get a lot of pleasure to the job. I'm on a journey and I want to see that journey through. Um, you know, so so in the end, the, to, the answer to the question is: as long as MPs keep re-electing the speaker, the speaker can stay. Well, Wonderful. Nice. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Lloyd, another one of our members. Hello, my name's Lloyd. Do you have any hobbies? <laughs> to, to, to be honest, Lloyd, uh, one of them is rugby league. Uh, I, I've, I've got to say, I. I think it's a great game. I love the sport, I'm very passionate about the sport. And the other is cricket as well. And I'm not sure whether it's a hobby or a punishment. I also a Bolton Wanderers fan. Um, so it's a kind of like been a hobby, but it's a bit of a punishment with with the with our last few seasons. Hopefully we may have turned the corner there. So sport does matter to me. So sport's one of my big hobbies. Hobbies that I enjoy. Um, you know, it, it, it's like everything. You need something to switch off with. 
And I'm going to say sport is my switch off. So in that sense, not only does it switch off from uh, all the things I do, actually it's something I really enjoy. So I've got to say passionate. And I would say that my hobbies is definitely sport, starting with rugby league. Brilliant, brilliant. So Lindsay, we have Ben. Good afternoon, Sir Lindsay. My name is Ben. Could I ask if you could invite three people to dinner, past or present, who would they be and where? That's a very good question and uh, a tremendous question in who would you have to dinner? And I always think it's about the people you didn't know as well. So, you know, you, you look around, um, you know, you look at American, American presidents and what I would always say, it's probably John F. Kennedy, JFK, this guy that came along and changed American politics. He was, he was new. He was something different. And he brought politics alive in the States like nobody else had done till then. So I've got to say, I think, I think I'd have to have him there as, as one of my uh, first dinner guests. And then, of course, you, you, you look around. Who's made a real difference across the world? Uh, you know, you look to the regime in South Africa, apartheid, and you've got to say, you know, the hate, the way that black people were treated under a regime that I could never believe in or tolerate. So I've got to say, the way that Nelson Mandela dealt with a situation where he was imprisoned for standing up for the people of South Africa and to come out and to show... You know, and he did it in such a dignified way. I've got to say, I think I'd have a lot of hate in me. And I think I would be really, you know, to, to watch somebody do it with such dignity in what he'd been through and then to become president, I've got to say, it would be really nice to have him there and, and, and for him to, you know, to be with us. And I think, you know, like, like most things within a good dinner party, you've got to get the balance right. So we've got... To, couple of historic great politicians. So, you know, we, we need something to, to try and change the mood of that. And maybe, you know, I'm a great fan of music and a great fan of Motown and things like that. You know, and I'd love to think that we could have had somebody like Tammy Terrell, you know, somebody who was taken very young, who was, did a wonderful duet with Marvin Gaye. And I just think somebody who can kind of like try and change the mood as well. We've got the heavy politics, then we can talk about music and the passion of music. And how does music fit into politics as well? So I think those will be the kind of dinner guests that I'd really like to enjoy. Fantastic, great answers. Uh, next question is from another one of our members. It's our beautiful Georgia. Hello, so Lindsay. My name is Georgia Hampton. What is your favorite film? A very, very good question. And, and I think I always do it in two ways, isn't it? You know, what I'm going to time warp myself with age, and I've got to say I'm still a fan that believes that Sean Connery was by far the best James Bond. And therefore, I've got to say, you know, you look at uh, any of his films, actually, but I think in particular Goldfinger, I think it was so special in the way that it was all put together. But, of course, you know, some will say, well, that's a bit different. What about something a bit more lighthearted? And I've got to say, I, I still love the classics. Laurel and Hardy are absolutely fantastic. But I think something a bit more modern, something like Ferris Bueller's Day Out. If I really want to switch off, sit at home, get the popcorn out, have a good laugh, something that will always make me laugh, it's got to be Ferris Bueller's Day Out. Great film. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, our next question is from another one of our... Hello, Sir Lindsay. My name is Emma. And I would like to ask you, do you have any pets? Do we do, thanks, Emma. Yeah, I've got um, a few, a few, probably a few too many pets. Uh, well, well, I would argue you could never have enough. But uh, So we start off, we've got a dog, a Patterdale Terrier, uh, Betty, uh, who's quite... Uh, it's quite, um, yeah, she's, she's interesting. She keeps good order, so she was named after Betty Boothroyd, which is always very useful. Uh, and, of course, we've got the parrot there. We've got Boris the parrot. 
um, as you can imagine who he's named after. But uh, he, he, he's well known as Boris. He repeats himself and his feathers aren't always in the right place. So he, he's well known. Um, we've, we've got uh, Patrick the Cat, uh, a very posh cat. He, uh, quite, quite a character. He's a, a bit of a big boy. He's a bit of a bruiser. Uh, but, but he thinks he's very special and above everybody else. Um, you know, the way he walks around. So he was named after a peer called Patrick McCormack, who, who is a very grand peer next door. And he always asks about the cat. Um, as I say, the, the dog Betty, Betty Boothroyd, of course, uh, that's why I named because she likes to keep good order. Um, so so they, they work quite well. And of course, I think you can see the tortoise as well. So we've got this tortoise that's about just over three stone in weight. And she's big. She's a very, very big girl. And basically, she's got a very hard shell and she's not for turning, so she had to be named Maggie. So I've got to say, you know, these pets are all part of, of, of coming up and down to London. The cat and the parrot come up, come up and down to London every week. The dog usually stays in the north. We leave them up there along with the tortoise. So, yeah, so we have these pets that travel around or completely part of our life. Does the Prime Minister know that he's, uh, a parrot's been named after him? I would suggest he does, to be honest. I'm, you know, I'm, I've never made any secret. And, of course, people do interviews. Um, you'll hear this parrot show, order, order, you know. So it's quite, uh, quite amazing. And lock the doors, he'll make all these things. Uh, and then he'll say, you know, uh, my wife's called Catherine. Catherine? Catherine? He'll shout away, you know. So, so he's got to know everybody. And Helen, who's chief of staff here, he'll say, Helen, come on, Helen, come on, Helen, because she's a bit slow at walking, you know, so there's parrot shouts. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Uh, we have a question from, from Emma. My name is Emma. Are you, B, Earth, Egg and Soaps, Rizzy Bean? And it's, it's interesting because... I had the G7 conference in Chorley, which was fantastic. We brought Speaker Pelosi over. We had the Italians, the French. They all came to Chorley. So we give them a taste of Lancashire. And we had the conference in Chorley, told them all about Lancashire, Lancashire food, and the quality of it. But on the Sunday, we took the conference to actually to Coronation Street. And we literally held the conference on the set of Coronation Street with the Romans returned there. So I've got to say, if I'm going to be in a soap opera, it's got to be Coronation Street. Fantastic. Fantastic. Did you have a pint while you were in there? It shows me pulling the pint. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't like to drink it. I'm not sure how long I've been in them pumps, but I did have a good go at pulling a pint. You know, I enjoyed every minute of it. It was good. Uh, so I met some of the... But the, the cast from Coronation Street as well. And to explain to the Americans that this is the longest soap opera in history going, you know, they were, they were quite taken away by it. And to actually, all the cars came down the cobbles, which doesn't normally happen. So we all drove down the cobbles, round and parked up and went to the studio. So I've got to say, it was a fantastic day. And, and it was a real thanks to ITV for making it happen. Oh, that's brilliant. So, Lizzie, we've come to the final question, and we have James, uh, who would like to ask the final question. Good afternoon, Sherlinger. My name is James. I would like to know, do you have any ambition to one day become Prime Minister? <laughs> I think those days are well behind me. <laughs> what I want to say is you... You set your life out when you come into Parliament as an MP. And I wanted to be a good MP for Chorley. I wanted to represent Chorley. And I've got to say, I, I'm one of those people, if I believe in something, I believe in standing by what I say. So in some respects, I, I suppose I find it very difficult. You know, um, I don't believe in top-up fees for students. I believe in free education. And, of course, I blotted my copybook with the Labour Party because I couldn't vote to bring in tuition fees and things like that. So I, I've got to say, I've got a bit of a conscience that actually I like to do the things that matter for my constituents, not what I'm being told. And I think that will be quite difficult as a prime minister because sometimes you've got to do a line. So, so in some respects, you make your decision. And my decision was that once the deputy speaker came up for election, there's nobody who's ever going to give it to me. But once it was elected, 
the one thing I'm good at is winning elections because I've had a marginal seat. So once they said the deputy speaker is going to be elected, we won that. And for nine years, I, I won it a few times to be the deputy, getting re-elected. So from that stance, it was always going to be, there's only one job after being deputy speaker, and that's to become speaker. So you, 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 there was a fork in the road. You can go one way or the other. And the way I went was to become the 158th speaker of the House of Commons. So, Lindsay, we really appreciate you giving up your time today. Uh, can I just say, it's been my absolute pleasure. And do thank everybody for the questions. And thanks to Buzz TV. I've really enjoyed it. Please keep in touch. All the best for the future.